Uh, we are close to the celebration of our country's independence, or as I saw uh, on the internet the other day, Brexit 1776. Um, seriously, the best way for us to celebrate our independence is to recall every Sunday morning when we're able to gather in this place and worship our Lord and Savior in a manner suitable to us is the best way to recall our independence because it was upon that foundation and it was upon that premise that our country was established so many years ago. And it is because of that that we can gather here today and that we can open up God's Word and we can study and learn what it is that we are to do and how it is that we are to live as we follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, you know, with having our grandkids with us, uh, I heard in the car a number of times last night uh, something related to the Scripture passage that we'll be looking at this morning. Something along the lines of treat the other person the way that you want to be treated. Any of you recall as parents, or even if you can recall back that far, to when you were kids when things would get tense around the house, mom or dad would say, now, 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 you treat so-and-so just the way you want to be treated. Any of you ever recall hearing that? Of course you did. Yes, I see people pointing to parents right now, okay? Well, do you recall when that was said to you just how unnatural that seemed to you? I mean, let's be serious. Be nice to somebody that's mean to you when you're a child. You know, it's kind of like, really? I want to hit them back harder. I want to call them a tougher name. I want to see them cry harder than what they made me cry. I mean, truthfully, isn't that what we do a lot of times? And as adults, when someone, in whatever fashion, hurts us or harms us, don't we, isn't our first reaction sometimes to say, boy, I'm going to get them back. You just wait. I, I used to work for a fellow that one of the things that I recall hear him saying a lot of times was, well, we're not going to get them today, but one of these days they'll walk through our crosshairs, and when they do, we're going to get them. You see, that is the natural man's response when someone does us harm. That's the sinful human being's response. It's entirely natural for us to do that. But I want us to understand this morning as we look again into Dr. Luke's account of the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus is in the middle of changing our perspective on how life should be lived. If you recall last week, uh, he blew up one of the paradigms of belief during that time frame. Now, I know people have been making fun of me for using the word paradigm. Get used to it. You're going to hear it a lot, okay? Last week, Jesus blew up the paradigm that was current at the time that said, I can look at someone and tell them, or tell by looking at them how righteous they are, because the more righteous they are, the more God has blessed them materially. I can look at someone and tell them, tell you their exact spiritual state on the basis of how God has gifted them. You see, that was common belief at the time. And Jesus said, no, blessed are the poor. Blessed are those that hunger. Blessed are those that thirst after righteousness. You see, he was there telling them something different than what they'd heard. And this morning we're going to continue on in Dr. Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 27 and go through verse 36. Now, if you're new to your Bible, Luke is found in the New Testament. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke. It's the third book in the New Testament. And we're in chapter 6. I'm going to be reading from the Holman Christian Standard Translation. And what we're going to be looking at this morning... Calls to question for each one of us in our heart. How do we deal with adversity? How do we deal when someone is angry with us? How do we deal with someone that hurts us? 
whether they're in our family, in the workplace, in the community, how do we deal with this in light of Jesus' new teaching on this? So join me as I read, starting in verse 27. But I say to you who listen, love your enemies. Do what is good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone hits you on the cheek, offer the other also. And if anyone makes away with your coat, don't hold back your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks you. And from one who takes your, excuse me, give to everyone who asks you. And from the one who takes your things, don't ask for them back. Now let's start into this a little bit at a time. First of all, let's look at what Jesus is saying. He says, but I say to you. That seems kind of an interesting way to put it. In Matthew, as he records this, Matthew records some additional words that were said at that time. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 38 and 39, he says, You have heard it said, but I say to you. That right there to his audience was something remarkable. It was something that was going to, 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 to gain their attention. You see, and we've talked about this before, if you recall, the scribes and the Pharisees taught the people. That's who the people, the common folk, looked to their religious instruction, to their spiritual formation. They looked to the scribes and the Pharisees. This is to whom Jesus is referring when he says, you have heard it said, or here in Luke when he says, but. He's drawing a contrast between what they had heard from the scribes and the Pharisees and what he was about to say. And this in and of itself would have caught their attention for this reason. You recall we talked about earlier the scribes and the Pharisees never taught on their own authority. In fact, they were very careful to say when they taught something, well, Rabbi Gamaliel in the time of your great-grandfathers said this, or Rabbi so-and-so at the time of the great return from Babylon taught this. They always prefaced anything that they were going to say by somebody else said this at another time and then they would say this but Jesus look what he says you've heard this said but I say to you you see the people were not used to that Mark chapter 1 verse 22 in in an account that's somewhat parallel to this and they were astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one that had what authority and not as the scribes. You recall we spent time earlier in Luke where Jesus began to establish His authority over many things. He began to establish His authority over the Sabbath. He began to establish His authority and capability to forgive sins. You remember when the men tore the hole in the roof of the house and lowered the paralyzed man in front of Jesus. What did He say to him? First, He said what? Your sins are forgiven. And that just threw the scribes and the Pharisees there into a tailspin because they said he's blaspheming, only God has the capability of doing this. And Jesus said, which is easier? For me to say something that you can't check out or to do something you can verify on the spot. Pick up your mat and walk. You see, Jesus was establishing his authority as he walked through this. And as he's teaching these folks, he taught with that authority. And that in and of itself got their attention. What is this man about to say? This is revolutionary. No one teaches on their own authority except this man. And there's something different about him. Now, for us today, that's not that big a deal. But for those folks then, because see, we, we have this understanding of who Jesus was, but then this was revolutionary. And then he drops it on them. He takes something totally opposite of what they've been taught all their lives. And he says, love your enemies. Now what do you think that the scribes and Pharisees had been teaching all these years? Exodus 21. You all know this. You've heard it. An eye for what? And a tooth for what? See, they thought that that was the right teaching because it's a measured response. You've heard that term probably in the news lately. A measured response. They take a tooth. They take your tooth. You take a tooth back. They take an eye, your eye, 
you take an eye back, a measured response. Not, don't come back with an overwhelming force, just meet force with force. That's what they were taught. It was a type of controlled or measured revenge, if you will. Okay, But that was the teaching of the time. And here Jesus comes and absolutely blows it apart. Love your enemies. We need to look at what he's saying here. The verb that he's using, the command, agapao, agapeo, is where we get our term agape love. What does it mean? Agape love, or agapao, as he was using it, essentially means this. I will love this person because by God's grace, I choose to love them. The type of agape love that we have, brother and sister for brother and sister, is that type of love. It's empowered by God's love, and it's by our grace that we love one another as brothers and sisters. And that should be easy for anybody to understand. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. If we've confessed our sins and placed Jesus as Lord and Savior of our life, we have brothers and sisters everywhere who have done that. We have this love for them. That's easy to understand. But Jesus uses this same verb that is designed for Christian fellowship. To whom? Your enemy. This is revolutionary. Love your enemy the same way you love each other. Where does this type of love spring from? How can we, as human beings, understand this kind of love? Is this not remarkable? Even for us today, let's be real. Let's be real. In the world we live in, the world tells us today... Uh, you all remember the movie... Uh, it, I'm going to date myself here, but it was a Kevin Costner movie called The Untouchables. Do you remember there was a character in there played by Sean Connery? And Sean says, you need to learn the Chicago way, young man. He says, they bring a club, you bring a knife. They bring a knife, you bring a gun. You see, that's what we're taught. They bring a club, we bring a knife. They bring a knife, we bring a gun. That's the world we live in. This is just as revolutionary for us today as it was then. We are to love the world with the same love that we love one another how can that be you see this type of love is embodied in the third chapter of john verse 16 john 3 16 we probably most of us could recite it but understand that a translation of that goes like this god loved the world in such a way god loved the world in such a manner God loved the world in a, in a way that we cannot understand such that He sent His only Son. You see, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, out of the love that they had for each other and for this world, dispatched Jesus here to die on a cross for us. It wasn't like God said, hey, I'm taking volunteers. It wasn't like Mission Impossible, Jesus, your assignment if you choose to accept it. Is this? No. Out of the love that this perfect unity, this perfect three in one had, they came to earth in the body of Christ, in the incarnation of Christ. This is the perfect love that we must understand before we can begin to understand what love your enemies means. Now, not only is the source of this love the Trinity, and the love that God had for us. But understand, too, that when Jesus says, love your enemies, He is speaking from experience. He is speaking from what He knows will happen. He's speaking from, from His perspective, in some respects, what already has happened. Paul talks about this in Romans 5, verses 8, and then verses 10. Listen. Romans 5, 8, but God proves His own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God and sin cannot be in the same place. God cannot abide sin. God is holy. God is totally other. God is beyond anything that we can imagine. And sin is something He cannot abide. But yet while each one of us were yet sinners, He sent Christ here to die for us. 
Think of that love. Think of what that took. Romans 5, 10. For if while we were what? Enemies. We were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Then how much more having been reconciled will be saved by His life. When Jesus said, love your enemies, He was surrounded by enemies. He was surrounded by those that wanted to see Him die. If He were here today on this earth, He would be surrounded by enemies. He understands this. He doesn't speak as one advising. He speaks as one having been there. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. That is one of the most difficult teachings that Jesus has ever taught it's one of the most difficult ones for us to understand because it runs so counter to our sinful, fleshly self. Jesus goes on in verses 28, 29, and 30 to kind of give us a background of what he's talking about here. He says, do good to those who hate. Return hatred with good deeds. That's what Jesus is saying, return hatred with good deeds. He says, bless those that curse you. When someone curses you, what do we do? If we are following Jesus' teaching, we bless them. Pray for those who mistreat us. Now, that's not a time to invoke one of the imprecatory psalms, okay? Just understand that, okay? What he's saying is you pray for them and you pray for their heart. It says to offer the other cheek when struck. And, and I'm going to develop this a little bit further, but here Jesus begins to give a little bit of hint. Not only is this a way to live, but he's saying this is a way to stay engaged. Somebody strikes you on the cheek, you make the other one available to them. What oftentimes do we do when people strike our cheek? What's our, one of our first reactions? To withdraw, to go the other way, to leave them alone. Jesus is talking about not only a means of behavior here, but listen, he's talking about a way to engage the lost people of the world, to love your enemy. It says, give more than what is stolen. Give, it, you know, give, give beyond what somebody may take from you. Lend to somebody. Give to those without ever expecting anything in return. Be responsive when someone asks for your help. Don't do it expecting a return. Look, I love my bank and I love my friends at the bank and I love my bankers, but they're in that business to gain a return on their money. That's their business. We are not business. We are Christ followers. We are not to seek a return. Now, are any of these easy? Of course not. None of this is easy. We cannot do them consistently on our own power. If we try to do this on our own power, and even if we are reasonably successful without this love of Jesus Christ, it leads to pride, it leads to arrogance, and it leads ultimately to where we turn our back on those because we're so focused on our own pride. We must understand the love of Jesus Christ in order to do this. Now, just an aside here, some people talk to me after we talk about this sort of thing, and that says, well, does that mean I'm just supposed to be a doormat and let people walk all over me? No, that's not what it means. We are to be wise about that. But what it says is, ultimately, we are to, out of a grateful heart, out of a loving heart, to engage the world in such a way. I mean, stop and think about it. You're at work. You're competing with somebody for something, for a promotion or something else. And they do something that puts you behind. You, you've all seen these games played at work, have you not? And you respond to them with love. Does that not catch their attention? Does not all of what Jesus is saying here to do, is that not going to catch somebody else's attention? You see, that's the point. Not only is the behavior the point, but the point is this. We want to engage the culture around us. And what is more shocking than to return ill will with good feelings? What's more shocking than to return curses with blessings? I know some of you sitting here this morning, I have talked to you, have been in work situations where people have done this and you have returned it 
with kind-heartedness, with calmness, with blessing, and it has made a difference in other people's lives. That's what Jesus is saying. Engage, continue to engage, okay? Then he drops this on us, what we talked about at the beginning. Verse 31, this is the new paradigm. He says, just as you want others to do for you, do the same for them. That's what we call what? What's that known as? You you probably know it in the King James. Do unto others as they do unto you. Now, detractors have said, well, Jesus is just repeating a common aphorism, a common wisdom of the time. He's He's just repackaging what was out there. Well, you know what? People have researched that, and what Jesus said is entirely different than those worldly wisdom pieces that were going around. Listen to what the summary of what was taught in that regard sounds like. It sounds like this. Do not do to others what you do not want done to you. Do you see the difference? Do not do to others what you don't want done to you as opposed to do unto others as you would have them treat you. Do you see the fundamental difference? One is engaging. One is proactive. The other one builds walls. Because how's the best way not to do something to somebody and not to have that somebody do something to you? You build a wall. Jesus says do. Act. Be proactive. Engage them. Stay engaged when they're mean to you. Stay engaged. Do not leave them alone. How much must we dislike, and dare I say even hate someone, if we don't engage them for the gospel? Think about that. If we value the salvation that we have, how much must we dislike somebody not to take every opportunity to engage them in a conversation about Jesus Christ. And that's all he's saying is here, is engage people. Here's a great opportunity. When somebody's mean, return it with kindness. That will get their attention. And they'll say, why are you being nice to me when I've been such a jerk to you? And you say, well, let me tell you why. Let me tell you about a love that's not the love that natural men and women have for each other. Let me tell you about something called agape love. Let me tell you about the source of that. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ. You see, that's what this is about. Leaving others alone is not the point. Engaging others is. Let's look on now. Forgive me. Uh, I know the choir behind me is real worried they keep me... They keep seeing me turn page after page after page. Uh, I found out this week I'm going to have to have dual cataract surgery. And which means I have to stay out of all my, I wear rigid gas permeable contact lenses. I have to stay out of them a month for each decade that I've worn them. That's nearly five decades, folks. And these glasses are 10 years old. So if any of you are making faces to me this morning, I can't see you, okay? (laughs) So, so today's your day to get that out of your system, because I can't tell the difference. You, you see, look at the font size that I'm using up here, okay? Because I can't see much anything, okay? Alan and his brother actually look alike, okay? <laughs> well, you see... Jesus tells us in verses 32 through 36, he said, even if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Is it not love to somebody? Is it not easy to love those that love you? I mean, let's be honest. Is it not great to come to this fellowship on Sundays and on Wednesdays and other times and know immediately when we walk in this door, we're going to be around some folks that we love? That's great. Jesus is not knocking that. All he's saying is, guys, Even sinners do that. Where's the credit to you if all you ever do is love the people that love you? Where is the advantage for the kingdom if that's all that you do? Even sinners love love those who love them. If you do what is good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? To return a good favor for a good favor. Nothing wrong with that. We should do that. But Jesus is saying, 
Where is the good for the kingdom? Where is the credit? Where is the advancement of God's kingdom? If we do that, because you see, even those that don't know Jesus do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Again, nothing wrong with lending. Nothing wrong with, with, with lending tools or time or help or anything like that to, to somebody. If you expect them to return it to you, where's the credit? Where's the gain for the kingdom? You see, he says, but love your enemies. Is he not repeating a theme here? He says, but love your enemies. Do what is good and lend, expecting what in return? Nothing. How many times do we do something expecting something in return? You see, he says, then your reward will be great and you will be sons of and daughters of the Most High. You see, Jesus is saying you do this, the only way you can do this is to be my follower. And if you're my follower, you're sons and daughters of the Most High. If you do it without expectation of return, if you do it without you know, expecting love in return. Any of you have a family member that's just downright unlovable? Oh, wow, I didn't expect to hear that back. <laughs> but don't you love them anyway? Yeah, well, it's, it's like that when we're in the world. We need to love those that are unlovable because we know we're not going to get any love in return. But listen to what he says here. For he is gracious to the ungrateful and the evil. Now, why does he throw that in there? But he's gracious to the ungrateful and the evil. We who have accepted Christ as our Savior understand grace. It's through God's grace that we even have the faith and the capability to place our faith and trust in Him and to receive Him as our Savior. But what about, stop and think, what about people, you, you, you come in to, think of it this way, you wake up in the morning and you look outside and it's a beautiful cool morning, it's about 65 degrees, the sun's shining, the birds are singing, and you say, thank you Lord for this beautiful day. Anybody ever do that besides me? Well, do you realize that there are a whole lot of sinners out there enjoying that same day? Will you ever think about that? You ever think about that? You see, God's saying here, Jesus is saying here, that, that God's gracious to the ungrateful and the evil. We have this thing called common grace that we're all under. Even the evil people have the ability to draw breath. They have this capability. And Jesus is saying, you know, God's gracious to everybody. Be merciful just as your Father also is merciful. That's where it changes a little bit. Be merciful. You know, when it comes to the end, when it comes to the end of our lives, there's only going to be one thing that matters. And that is whether we've confessed our sins and placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If we've done that, we will receive what? God's what? His mercy. If we don't, we will receive what? God's what? Judgment. His justice. God is perfectly just and He is perfectly merciful. How do people outside of the people that we love and the people that we know are ever going to know this love, this forgiveness, this mercy if we do not show it to them ourselves? That's the point of love your enemies. Show other people Jesus because Jesus did not have to die for our sins. Is Jesus getting anything back? Now think through this. Is Jesus getting anything back from dying for us? Is he getting anything in return that he didn't already have? He's the second person of the Trinity. He's God's agent of creation. God, God is complete within himself. So it's through this love that he does this. And it's through this same love that we engage our community. Remember our vision? Serving Jesus. Making disciples. Building community. It's how we build community. We show the community around us Jesus Christ by returning good for evil. Returning love for unlove. Now I don't know where you are this morning in your walk. I may be talking about something this morning that's foreign to you. Possibly you've never understood 
who God is and then understood your own sinfulness in light of who God is. And possibly you have never confessed your sin and asked Christ to forgive you. Possibly you have never done this. This would be a great time to settle that this morning. You can come down this morning when we, when we give a time of response. You can catch me afterwards. You can make an appointment. I'll meet you anywhere, anytime to talk about that. Perhaps you have done that, but for whatever reason you've not followed him in believer's baptism. That's an easy thing to fix. Maybe you're looking for a place to put your life. To be in a group of people that love one another. A people who are glad to see each other on Sunday morning and on Wednesday night. And glad to see each other when we run into each other outside as we build our community. This church would be a great place for you to plant your life and to plant your skills and to plant your efforts. Maybe there's a relationship in your life that all it takes is for that person to look at you cross-eyed and you get fired up and you're ready to fight. Jesus said to love your enemies. Jesus said to return good or return evil with good. Jesus said to give beyond what they give to you, expecting nothing in return in actuality. I don't know where you are this morning. This altar is open. If you'd like to come and pray, you can pray in your pew. But whatever it is, as the Holy Spirit has touched your heart this morning, we're going to stand and sing in here in just a minute. There's no better time than to respond this morning to loving your neighbors and to loving those around you that show you ill will. Will you stand with me, please?